The Ford Mustang line is undergoing a lot of changes right now. It's still mostly a lineup of V8 powered rear drive sport coupes with tire shredding performance to match. The newest of the bunch is the Ford Mustang Mach 1, an automotive greatest hits collection that combines our favorite parts of the Mustang GT, Bullet, and Shelby into one package. On the other hand, there is the Ford Mustang Mach-E. And as we've argued before, it is every bit as deserving of its pony badge as any of its two-door siblings. Right now, if you're a Mustang shopper, you can get the very best of the present with the promises of the future in one lineup. Here's what they're like. Where the Mach 1 distinguishes itself from every other Mustang is with its exterior styling. While it lacks the traditional shaker hood scoop of past Mach 1s, a dramatic graphics package on the hood and sides, Mach 1 specific wheels, and the most aggressive front splitter this side of a GT500 pair with prominent Mach 1 badging on the front fenders and between the taillights. Style is, of course, subjective, and nowhere is that truer than the Mach 1's retina searing grabber yellow paint. I'll admit, this shade works better with the black graphics, black wheels, and black grill, but it's far from my first choice on this car. Perhaps if grabber yellow were a Mach 1 exclusive color, I'd be more willing to drive around in a 16-foot V8 powered highlighter, but that honor goes to the Mach 1's subdued fighter jet gray, which you can't even get without stepping up to the range shopping Mach 1 Premium and then spending an extra thousand dollars for the Mach 1 appearance package. By comparison, the mach -E is delightfully unfussy. Contrasting the body color paint, rapid red in this case, with the gloss black wheel arches and roof breaks up the mach -E's visual mass and contributes to the optical illusion that the roof line is faster than it really is. Reception of the mach -E's traditional Mustang cues has been lukewarm, but I enjoy the modern take on the tri-bar taillights and the prominent rear haunches. The fascia is perhaps the most polarizing element, with the horseshoe mustache grill annoying some. The GT and his blacked out fascia should solve that particular issue. Overall, when tasked with translating Mustang to crossover, the mach -E looks and feels like a win. The gulf between the present and the future is most obvious under the hoods of these respective Mustangs, but it's also fairly obvious in the cabin, with the Mach 1 executing old school muscle car designs as well. It relies on animal based hides and metal accents, a cockpit light design with a high center console, and a traditionally sized and shaped touchscreen above physical climate controls. The Mach 1 updates its interior, first shown on the 2015 Mustang, with a trim specific dash applique, dash black, and ebony gray leather upholstery. Considering how wild the exterior is, we kind of had higher hopes for the cabin. Still, the Mach 1 makes the most of what it has. We enjoy the new dash trim, and for a real sporting touch, you can still snag a pair of Recaro branded front seats. The alt digital instrument cluster is neat, and it boasts a Mach 1 specific graphic on startup, but in terms of resolution, the cluster display is a bit behind the times. That's doubly true of the center display, which runs Ford's older Sync 3 software on an 8 inch screen. Physical buttons abound, which is in stark contrast to the screen intensive Mach E. Clean and modern is the name of the game in the Mach-E, both in terms of its design and in its choice of materials. The interior is vegan, relying on leatherette, vinyl, fabric, and plastic instead of animal products. The finishes on the seats, door panels, and around the steering wheel are every bit as rich as the Mach 1's cow-based hides. The two cars share loose design similarities, with a double bubble dash present in both cabins, but more exaggerated on the Mach-E. That allows it to better tie in with classic Mustangs. We're less keen on the open front seats. The lack of a traditional transmission tunnel means the center console sits low and mostly out of the way. Maybe this is reminiscent of older models with bench seats and simple floors, but compared to the Mach 1, the Mach-E's front seats are one of the least Mustang-like pieces of design on the car. The other distinguisher in the cabin comes in the back, where there's a spacious trunk and three abreast seating. I get why Ford went with a three-person bench, but the Mach-E would be more of a Mustang with a two plus two arrangement, practicality be damned. Of course, the tech suite in the all-electric Mustang is as advanced as anything Ford is building right now. The 15.5-inch touchscreen runs Sync 4A, the company's newest infotainment system, and it feels light years ahead of what you'll find in the Mach 1. But where the Mach-E is more modern than the Mach 1, it still feels like a Mustang from behind the wheel. So despite all that wonderful noise, this does kind of feel just like a normal Mustang GT. That's not a bad thing, but if you were coming in here hoping for some radically different experience, we would recommend looking up prices on GT350s right now. 
that car had a lot more character under the hood. Much like past Mach 1s, this car is kind of a collection of bits and bobs from other Mustangs. Let me explain. Ford first introduced the Mach 1 name on a 1968 concept car, but the title arrived in production form a year later. That car, like the one we're driving, was only available with a V8 engine, packed black hood and side decals, and was solely offered in a fastback body. In the years that followed, the Mach 1 eventually supplanted the Mustang GT as the volume performance model, not unlike how this car has taken the place of the performance pack level two on the standard GT. But as the years went on, and like the broader Mustang lineup, the Mach 1 got bigger, heavier, and slower before Ford retired the badge in the late 70s. It returned in 2003, and like the car we have here, it served as a replacement for a bullet Mustang and borrowed performance pieces from other pony car trims. Much like any other Mustang, the heart and soul of this car is the engine, or in the mach -E's case, the motor. Here we have a 5-liter V8 borrowed from last year's Bullet Mustang. It has 480 horsepower, and it's a little bit more than just a carryover. This car gets its intake manifold and oil cooler, and on certain versions, you get the Tremec 6-speed manual transmission from the GT350. We don't have that though. We have a rather unlikable and difficult 10-speed automatic transmission, and it responds somewhat well. That sound you're hearing is the same active exhaust that you can get on a Mustang GT or Performance Pack Level 1 or on last year's Bullet. It sounds really good. We just wish the transmission were as responsive as the engine sounds. It kind of jumps around. It doesn't really want to listen to you when it comes to up changing and downshifts and all that fun stuff. Now, why are we being so critical of the 10-speed automatic? Well, it's because we can vouch for the goodness of the Tremec 6-speed manual. It is a delightful manual transmission with solid throws, predictable clutch behavior, but on the Mach 1, it goes a bit further, adding an automatic rev matching feature that works pretty damn well. That is the transmission that we would have. Still, there's an undeniably Mustang-worthy experience when standing on the throttle. New software for the magnetic dampers, revised power steering tuning, stiffer springs and sway bars, and standard Michelin Pilot Sport 4S tires give it some serious cornering verve. So the Mach-E is available in a range of powertrains and battery sizes. What we have here is the fastest version for the moment. This is the Mach-E with the extended range battery and the dual motor all-wheel drive system. We have 346 horsepower and 428 pound-feet of torque with one motor on the front, one motor on the back. And powering it all is an 88 kilowatt hour lithium ion battery pack. Ford quotes the zero to 60 time in this car as taking 4.8 seconds. And that feels a little bit conservative. The electric torque kind of messes with your mind a little bit because you can just step on the pedal and it's just, it is completely unlike the Mach 1 in that there is no buildup, there is no swell of torque. And every time you step on that throttle, there is a little, a little growl, a little bit of a, V8 engine mixed with Star Trek impulse drive. You can kind of hear it here. That is the propulsion sound, and you can turn it off if you don't like it, but I really question if you have a soul if you do that, because you want your car to make good noises. There are three drive modes in this car. There's whisper, engage, and unbridled, and that roughly translates to eco, normal, and sport. We're in unbridled right now, and it gives you the sharpest throttle response. It gives you a little bit more regen when you step off the gas pedal, the accelerator pedal, I'm sorry, and it gives you the most propulsion sound. Engage is kind of a healthy mix of the two, and then Whisper is the most relaxed. It's the quietest. It still offers a lot of regen because you're trying to recapture range, but it gives you a much duller throttle so that's easier to manage and less wasteful. Now, obviously we are not driving this car on a track, so I can't comment on how dynamic or how much more dynamic it might be than a performance pack level two. But if you've driven any of this current generation Mustang, you know that they are a good deal of fun to drive. They are light and they are nimble, especially relative to a car like a Dodge Challenger. But unlike the GT350, this car doesn't tramline at all. It's a much more livable everyday experience. Magnetic dampers deliver a firm ride, but not a brutal one. We've been driving around in sport mode and it's a really nice balance of firmness and compliance. 
The steering is still, it's still a Mustang, which is to say there's not a lot of feedback, but the ability to adjust the weight is very good. I like being able to switch between comfort, normal, and sport based on what I'm doing. The Mach 1 automatically adds a set of Brembo brakes. And again, these are the same as what you'll find on Performance Pack Level 2 from last year. They are good and they are powerful, but around town, I find the pedal to be a little bit grabby, especially at lower speeds. It's kind of hard to modulate and you will struggle pulling it into parking spots as you try to balance the stopping power of the pedal with the actual forward momentum of the car. What I really like about the Mach-E is the how it drives and feels like a Mustang through the corners. It moves around. This is not some hard edge new Mustang. It's, it's an older Mustang. It, it is not a track tool, but it is an enjoyable driving experience. The way the body moves through corners with the low center of gravity thanks to that battery pack is really engaging in a way that not a lot of crossovers can match. There's a little bit of understeer. The, the front end feels a tiny bit lighter, but there's so little body roll and it's so predictable in the way that the body moves that it really encourages you to push through corners. And this isn't even the super agile one. The, the Mach-E GT is gonna come out with wider, stickier tires, more aggressive suspension tuning, and I think it's gonna be even more exciting. What I wish this car would do a little bit better, I wish there was a little bit more weight in the steering. A little bit more feedback would be good too. Most of the feedback that you get is through the chassis. You can feel the tires working. You can, you can judge the grip level, but it's mainly through the seat of your pants rather than through the steering wheel. So like a lot of EVs, the Mach-E is available with a one pedal drive system. And I have that engaged right now. And what that means is I lift off the accelerator and the car slows and it will slow down to a stop. You can turn this off, and when you set it up like that and put the car in that situation, the brake pedal is pretty responsive. It's, it's not grabby or difficult to manage. This is not a performance braking system, which, which is good and bad. I found the, the Brembo brakes on the Mach 1 to be a little bit grabby and a little bit difficult to modulate, but this, it feels more natural when you're coming to a stop. The Mustang Mach 1 is not better than the GT350. It's definitely not better than the GT500. But what it is, is the pinnacle of the non-Shelby gas-powered Mustang. It is a great package, but it might not be the one that everyone wants in the year 2021. So what is the Mach-E driving experience? It is a crossover. There, there's, there's no escaping that. I'm not gonna try and convince you otherwise, but it also perfectly matches what we want from a Mustang. It is fun. That is that is first and foremost what comes through. Driving this car, accelerating this car, taking turns in this car is enjoyable in a way that very few crossovers can manage. It feels like a muscle car, but it also is pretty darn livable. You know, it's quiet. The ride is, it's firm and it suffers a little bit on these lovely Detroit roads, but it is compliant enough that you can easily drive this every day. In fact, I'd say on a day-to-day -day basis, this is more livable than a normal Mustang. This is a ideal mix of the Mustang experience. Despite their different looks, the Mach-E and the Mach-1 are very much two sides of the same coin. The Mach-1 is the best of what came before, presented in a modern wrapper that promises an exciting near future. The Mach-E and its all-electric powertrain combined with Mustang-inspired looks and a driving character worthy of that pony car badge is the promise of the long-term future, where zero emissions mingle with muscle car worthy performance. For pony car enthusiasts in the here and now who can pop down to their local Ford store and pick up either one of these authentic Mustangs, 2021, it's a pretty good time to be alive.